Let me get first to the accusations. A lot of times, us Christians get lots of accusations. We begin to talk about uh, Bible prophecy, especially in the area of Bible prophecy, because when you talk about Bible prophecy, and when you talk about how the media portray us Christians, they always like to accuse us of uh, people who live in a lala land, who are so gung-ho on self-fulfilling the Bible. You know, we make the Bible, we fulfill the prophecies in the Bible in order to prove the existence of God. And I got a problem with that accusation because if you look at the things that were fulfilled in our time, specifically the establishment of the state of Israel after it's been in exile for thousands of years, and we ask ourselves the question, in order for the state of Israel to exist or to have existed in 1948, created in one day, the element that, create, that caused this creation of this state is definitely, no one can deny it, was the element what we call as the Holocaust. The Holocaust is the main mechanism that fueled or ushered the process of establishing that state. So if we indeed are a people that are trying to enforce things to self-fulfill the Bible, that means us Christians must have created the Holocaust to fulfill the Bible. When in fact, it was the very enemies of the Bible, Nazism, Islamism, even in the Middle East, Jews were persecuted. It is the very people that hated Bible prophecy, that worked tirelessly for the things not to happen, somehow inadvertently worked on fulfilling Bible prophecy. In other words, it really doesn't make any sense. It reminds me of the story of Jesus. You know, the devil wanted him crucified. Crucify him, crucify him. And what that caused was really fulfilling the Bible. So the very, as I said, the very elements that hate God end up doing God's work and they have no choice about it. But such is the Bible. They accuse us of attempting to usher in an apocalypse, that we want to usher in the apocalypse. That's why we talk about Bible prophecy. When in reality, if you look at it, uh, it is Ahmad and Nijad who's trying to usher in an apocalypse. He comes to the United Nations, and he makes a speech, and he's the only one that's talking about this coming of this Mahdi, the enlightened one, the Muslim Messiah. I don't even see Christian speakers speaking at the United Nations or speaking you know, at the White House in a political issue, begin to talk about anything eschatological. The eschatological issues that we talk about is among our church gathering. Yet Ahmadinejad is allowed to speak about his eschatological belief, ushering in this coming of this Mahdi figure. In fact, a lot of times I get this argument that, you know, so what? Muslims believe in their God, Christians believe in their God, Jews believe in a different God, Buddhists believe in a different God, but in fact, in reality, the descriptions of these gods are a little different, but in reality, we all worship the same God. The God of the Buddhist, Jehovah God, Allah are all the same deity. You get that all the time. We all worship the same God. In fact, every time I go to a restaurant, you know, I try to witness to the waitress or whatever, you know, they don't want nothing to do with you because they say, well, worship the same God, leave me alone. I say, okay. In fact, that's the main liberal argument, that the Christians are kind of crazy because they always emphasize that we are so mad about believing in one God and we don't believe in all the other religions. We're not kind of universal. Well, I like to always argue and say, okay, if you think that we all believe in the same God, can a liberal carry a poster, we all believe in the same God, Allah, Yahweh, Buddha, and take that poster in the middle of the pilgrimage in Mecca during the Islam's holy pilgrimage 
and carry the poster and tell me how long they live. But there's a problem, because before they get to Mecca, there is a big major sign. It has a four arrows, and the four wide lanes says, Lil Muslimina Fakat, which means only Muslims allowed. And there is an exit sign that says, Ghayr al Muslimin, non Muslims. So if you're liberal and you want to take my challenge, may I suggest you take that exit very quickly? Because if you get there and you show your poster, they will bring out a crescent shaped pendulum that will strike your head rolling to the ground within seconds. But they say, even if you're decapitated, somehow you still have a few seconds and your mind still functions. And in fact, you can still, eyes can blink. So if you're there and your head is severed, uh, may I suggest that you invite Jesus in your heart? <laughs> Don't worry about the separation between your head and your body. That will be taken care of during the rapture. And I always, you know, in fact, if you want to challenge me on this issue that we all worship the same God, uh, next time you run into a Muslim, uh, ask him a question. Say, what does Allah mean? They will instantly tell you, Allah means God. God and Allah is the same thing. The word for God in Arabic is the word Allah. Okay. Next question. My dear Muslim friend, I'm very interested in Islam. How can I become a Muslim? He gets very excited, of course. He will tell you very easily. Say, repeat after me. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. You say, okay. There is no God but God. He says, no, 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 no. You have to say there is no God but Allah. You say, wait a minute. You told me Allah means God. Why do I have to say there is no God but Allah? If Allah means God, I can say there is no God but God. And I, as a Christian, agree. There is no God but God, so we're in agreement. Why do I have to convert to Islam after all? Allah is a name of a deity. There is no buts, ifs, and ands about it. Even if the Arabic Bibles use the word Allah for God, because the translators of the Bible were forced to use the word Allah to kind of kowtow to the Islamic systems. But that's the condition that we live in. Everybody wants to have a universal God, and everybody wants peace. In fact, if there are any liberals out there, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden made it very clear. Ahmadinejad made it very clear. They gave a peace offer to the United States. They sent a letter to President George Bush. What does the letter say? Aslim to Islam. Become a Muslim, you will be at peace. That's it. All what you have to do is say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger and all of you liberals will be at peace. Now, anybody here is willing to make that statement? Raise your hand. Do you know I speak to liberals as well? Not one raised his hand. I broke the Guinness Book of Records on Americans not raising their hands whether they're fundamentalist right-wing bigoted Christians or whether they're Berkeleyite liberals, nobody raised their hands when I gave them the peace offer. Why? Because we're Americans. We thump our noses to anybody that tells us what to do. <laughs> but I have a question to the liberals. Why did you not raise your hand at the offer? I guess you have just converted at the moment I asked you that question, you have just converted to become a right-wing, bigoted, fundamentalist, Americanized bigot like myself. Why are you such a bigoted person? I guess we are all, what? American bigots. All of us. In fact, the difference between our God and the God of Allah is immense. The Quran clearly said, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثًا They don't believe who say that Allah, or God in this case, is one of a trinity. The triune God is a reject in Islam. It is an anathema. It is the most blasphemous thing you can think of when it comes to Islam, which is really a polemic study 
in order to renege and respond to the Christian argument that God took himself a body and came down to man and was the son of God, came in the flesh, died on the cross, spilt his blood for the salvation of humanity. What is the most holy thing in Christianity is the most blasphemous thing in Islam. And what is the most blasphemous thing in Islam is the most holiest thing in Christianity. That was the first thing I began to notice the moment that I opened a Bible. In fact, I remember reading some parts of the Bible at fifth grade. I remember the time when in school you could write a letter to something that was called the voice of healing in Jerusalem. And you buy a stamp, very cheap, you put it on an envelope, you put it in this box, and all of a sudden, a week later, you get a package in the mail. And you open it up, it's an Arabic Bible. The first thing I got in mail, in the mail since I was born, the first thing I got was an Arabic Bible. And I began to read. I said, ask my father, am I allowed to read this Bible? He says, go ahead and read it, son. But every time you read anything that says Jesus is the Son of God, or God is a Father, or God is the Holy Spirit, check it out. Just erase it. Everything else is good except that. And that's how I was reading the Bible. Amazing. You can understand, you know, that because Muslims believe that, you know, they, they, they supposedly believe in the Bible. They supposedly believe in the prophets. They supposedly believe in the same God as the Bible. When in reality, they don't. I began to see the difference between the Quran and the Bible on so many elements. By the time I reached high school, I remember even my teacher, Sheikh Naim Ayyad, who began to tell us about Islamic eschatology. Islamic eschatology is in such that it stole many elements from the Bible. Somebody out there was taking biblical prophecies and tweaking the end results. Sort of like the battle when the nations come against Jerusalem. That's in Islam as well. In fact, Muhammad the prophet clearly made that prediction. The day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel in Jerusalem and the surrounding nations. Then the trees and the stones will cry out. There is a Jew hiding behind me. Come, O Muslim. Come, O servant of Allah. Come and kill him. So the Jews must be in Israel. So when the Jews came to Israel, to the Muslims, that was part of the fulfillment of the Islamic eschatology. But there is a time will come when the battle will ensue in which the Muslims will annihilate all the Jews. But they will only annihilate the male Jews. Now that battle comes in Zechariah. And I remember in the class we were asking, what, what about the women? What do you do with the women? They said, we take them as concubines. One student asks, well, you said we can have children with concubines. How can you have children with women you're not married to? Is that adultery? The answer was, no, it's not adultery. One student asks, is it consensual? And the answer came very quickly. It doesn't have to be. And the examples were given that the Prophet Muhammad, when he killed the Jews of Saudi Arabia, consummated his right with a tribe's wife in a tent in his way back to camp after the battle. That's rape. But when I read in the book of Zechariah, I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. The houses will be rifled and the women ravished. Now, I do not have to explain what the word ravished means. Now, I began to ask myself a question. Because my inner soul began to drive me crazy. Any normal human being rejects the idea of rape. It doesn't make any sense unless you are truly a sicko. And I had an American mother who taught me how not to be a sicko like many of the sickos that I see around me. Sure, I grew up a terrorist. Sure, I wanted to kill Jews. But the idea of rape was totally an anathema in my soul. The question became, why does Allah condone it in Islam? And the God of the Bible condemns it. 
There's something right about the Bible. There is something right about the Word of God. There is something right about Isaiah when he said, For I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Foretelling the end from the beginning. So when you see it happen, that you know that I am God. I began to know the God of prophecy. I began to learn about these prophetic things. But the shocking element was to see that many of these prophetic things that I read in the Bible were very much incorporated in Islam as well. The Muslims believe in the coming of the Mahdi, which means the enlightened one. But the difference between the two messiahs of Islam and the messiah of the Bible is again that the God of the Bible was a father and a son and a Holy Spirit. In fact, in 1 John 2.22, who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist that denies the father and the son. So both the antichrist of the Bible and the Mahdi denies the father and the son. Both of them are called the great deceiver. Both the Allah of the Quran and the antichrist are called deceivers. Satan is called the deceiver. In fact, in the Quran, it says, وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَكَرِينَ Allah was the greatest of all deceivers. And what's the deception he is talking about in the Quran? He's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. That the people that were watching the crucifixion were tricked by Allah since Allah crucified Judas Iscariot instead of Jesus who resurrected without crucifixion and he since he was the great deceiver he deceived the people to think so in other words Muslims don't deny the crucifixion Muslims think that it was Judas Iscariot or somebody else who was crucified no one denies the crucifixion. The crucifixion is a historic reality. The question becomes, is who are you putting on that cross? Is who on the cross? Your Judas Iscariot, who cannot save? Or is the one who is on the cross the king of the Jews? Because Palestinian Christians claim that they also believe in the crucifixion of Jesus. But the question is, who did they place on that cross? The place on the cross is a Palestinian revolutionist. Hanan Ashrawi used to say, Jesus was a Palestinian revolutionist from my country. Many of the Palestinian Christian websites depict Jesus with, on the cross with barbed wires. And he uh, had refugee camps surrounding him because he came to liberate the Palestinians from the evil Zionist. You tell me if these are Christians. Because the Antichrist wants to also divide that land we call Israel. He wants to divide the land, it's very clear. He divides the land for gain. So I argue always with my Christian Arabs, if you want to divide the land of Israel, and the Antichrist wants to divide the land of Israel, and Christ condemns the division of the land of Israel, which side are you on? You cannot be on the side of Christ and on the side of Antichrist both at the same time. It doesn't work. You have to make a choice. Then you see many things in the Bible. In fact, Muslims, Ka'ab ibn al-Ahbar reported in the Hadith by the Prophet Muhammad that the way you recognize the coming of the Muslim Messiah, the Mahdi, is that he rides on a white horse. Who rides on a white horse? No. In the book of Revelation, the rider of the white horse is the Antichrist who brings false peace. In fact, they refer to the book of Revelation of the Christians to say our Mahdi is in the Christian book. He is the rider of the white horse in the book of Revelation. Everything was in reverse. Both the Mahdi will change the laws of the world and the biblical Antichrist 
will change the laws of the world. We see this all around in the world when we see the Muslims being active. What are the Muslims doing? What are the Muslims fighting about? What do the Muslims want to do in the United States of America? It's very simple. They want to change your constitution and establish an Islamic constitution. They want to change the laws of the land and establish Islamic Sharia law. So in essence, Muslims are set up for a religion of the Antichrist. Whether you believe that Islam plays a major role in biblical prophecy, or whether Islam plays the most major role in biblical prophecy matters little to me. What matters is that Islam and all scholars today agree. I haven't met a single Bible prophecy scholar who doesn't agree that Islam plays a major role in Bible prophecy because all the nations that are mentioned in the Bible that God mentions by name that he destroys, all of them are Muslim nations. In fact, both the Mahdi and the Antichrist will advance against the strongest of nations with the name of a foreign god. And that is in the book of Daniel chapter 11. And I hope you brought your Bibles. Do not leave without your stinger missile. In chapter 11, verses very rarely ever discussed. Verse 39. What does it say? In the whole chapter, it's talking about the Antichrist. It says in verse 36, Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is to deny the edicts of God. Because in America, when I say the word blasphemy, they think it's the G word. No, it's more than that. If you deny God's edicts, you've blasphemed God. If you deny God's ordinances that he ordained, you blaspheme God. If you deny God's prophetic word, you blaspheme God. If you deny Israel's right to exist, you blaspheme God. It's that simple. He will speak blasphemies against the God of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, depends on what translation you're looking at. Some say the gods of his fathers. Some say the God of his fathers. He doesn't honor the God of his ancestors long time ago, just as Moses was addressed by God. I'm the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So his ancestors had pagan deities or uh, idol worship, and he denies all these idols, and in their stead he replaces them to honor a God of fortresses. Verse 38, but in their place, these multiple idols, he shall honor a God of war. A God of fortresses no one can deny means God of war. A singular God that is a God of war or a God of battle. Americans have now been introduced after 9-11 to jihad. Every American knows what jihad means. It doesn't mean inner struggle. It doesn't mean this self-struggle. It's like the Mein Kampf struggle. Struggle against who? Struggle against the Jews, struggle against the Christians. Today it's a struggle against the West. Why? Because the Prophet of Islam said, I have been ordered to fight until all nations say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. I have been ordered to fight in battle all the nations. And look what it says. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God. Think about that. He acts against the strongest of fortresses. Strongest of fortresses. I don't know if I spelled fortresses correctly. English is my second language. I have an excuse. <laughs> Who is the strongest of all fortresses in the world today? No one can deny it. You whip the Japanese, 
you whipped the Russians. You're the strongest of all fortresses in the whole world. He will declare, declare war against America. So if Antichrist rules America and rules the whole world, why is it saying that he declares war against the strongest armies, the strongest nations of the world? What else does that mean? That also means that the Antichrist is not the strongest nation in the world. In fact, Osama bin Laden, Ahmadinejad, already declared war on America and Israel. And are they stronger than America? The United States of America can squish these countries like a worm. They can squish Hezbollah like a worm. Not a problem. So it doesn't say that the Antichrist rules the whole world. He declares war against the strongest of all nations. Then he will divide the land for gain. So he advances on the, na on the strongest nations as to advance. He it says advances this God. He advances his God, this foreign God, by the means of war. And that's exactly what the Muslims are doing. Islam is a system of antichrist. Because it does want to change the times, and it does want to change the laws, and it denies the right for women. Because it's very clear, he will not honor the desire of women. Western interpreters say the desire of women to bring forth the Messiah, so he doesn't honor the Messiah, who is the desire of every woman. And I've asked that question in America, and I've you know, broken the Guinness Book of Records, or no woman raising her hands when I asked the question. Is there any woman here desiring to bring forth, to produce a child, the Messiah? Anybody? I mean, there's one in every crowd. It's usually the guys, the gals know that not to raise their hands. Sometimes you ask questions, it's usually a guy that raises his hand. As I always say, man thinks he's smart, but woman is smarter. So what is that with that old, outmoded, you know, outmoded interpretation? It goes back to Genesis chapter 3. I will put enmity between you and the woman. The devil hates the woman. We see that in all cults. We see that in the old Mormonist cult, in which women is treated as uh, lower than the rights of a man. In fact, Many Muslims tell me that Islam treats women properly. Islam is very fair with women. I have but one question to ask and a challenge that no one was able to refute. There are many Muslims who marry non-Muslims. It happens all the time. People fall in love. Now, how often do you ever hear of a Muslim woman marrying a non-Muslim male? rarely ever happens why because if a woman who's a Muslim marries a Christian or a Jew she is to be killed by the family but a male can marry a Christian girl as many as he wants no problem why could there be a double standard there it's always the case everywhere I go an American woman a Christian marries a Muslim male in fact, that's kind of stupid to do because Christ himself said, do not be unequally yoked. Both cause death. Satan is the causer of death. He is the one that caused death in the garden. In fact, the, the name of Allah and one of his 99 names is Al-Mumit, the one who causes death. Al-Makr, the great deceiver. And all these names that attributes is attributed to Satan, what is attributed to Satan in the Bible is attributed to Allah in the Quran. Both condone rape. In fact, the rape epidemic in countries in Europe when Muslims are raping European girls is immense. Take the city of Malmo in Sweden, second or third largest city in Sweden. They sell chastity belts there for the girls. It is horrendous what happens. North African males, Lebanese males in Australia, a major epidemic in Australia where Muslims are raping girls and the clergy are approving of it. Say, well, if you show meat 
cats are going to eat it. If you sow flesh, dogs and cats will eat it. So what can we do? Cover your bodies, wear hijab. They are trying to enforce the hijab to make the woman look like a tent in order to establish an Islamic hegemony because Islam is very simple. Islam is not merely a religion. It is a constitution that wants to spread its tentacles throughout the whole globe in which Muslims becomes dominant, women dress like a tent, and Muslims and Islam becomes dominant over all the religions of the earth. In fact, many Christians read about the mark of the beast on the foreheads. And in Islam, it's very clear. Even in the Quran, talks about it. It talks about what is called Dabbat al-Ard, the beast of the earth. When the beast of the earth arises, it will mark all the Muslims on the forehead in order for the Muslims to be identified from that mark on the forehead from all non-Muslims. So if a group of people are sitting on the table, you'll identify the Muslims from that mark on the forehead. The unholy thing in the Bible is the holy thing in Islam taking a mark on your forehead. Both break treaties. Islam with its hudna establishing a ceasefire in which up to 10 years you as a Muslim nation must break that treaty before the, uh, uh, the, the finality of that treaty up to 10 years. Why? Because Islam forbids having an eternal peace treaty with non-Muslim nations. Because the goal of Islam is to spread Islam, whether it's by force or whether it's by peace. So how could you have an everlasting peace treaty? The Antichrist clearly breaks a treaty after seven years in the middle. Islam surely matches and it's in its uh, theological concept the religion of Antichrist. Both love booty. If you look at booty in Islam, just go look up a hadith uh, manuscript and search for the word booty. The Bible talks about booty. The Bible talks a lot about booty when it talks about the ends of times. In the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39, the battle of Gog and Magog as they come on Israel, they seek what? Booty, food, cattle. It's food they're seeking, not oil, and not the minerals of the Dead Sea. I mean, I like these books that I read, but they don't have any grounds. The Bible says food, it means food. For years I've been telling my wife, the price of food is going to increase. In fact, a couple months ago, I stashed my storage with a couple hundred pounds of wheat, a couple hundred pounds of rice, a couple hundred pounds of pinto beans and what have you. And sure enough, my wife thought I was crazy. A month later, boom, the price kind of doubled. I knew that the food is going to go up. The depletion of the food will continue with tsunamis and things like that. Because the book of Revelation tells us clearly, do not harm the wheat and the wine. What part of that is unclear? Both lead a Turkish-Iranian invasion. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad clearly said that you notice the coming of the Mahdi of Islam when he leads an invasion coming from Khurasan, and that is in Turkey. The Turkish flags will come. And I have a whole list of things that I've documented in my coming book, God's War on Terror. I have also a video series that discusses these elements in detail because one hour is not enough. It takes really hundreds of hours to go through this whole thing. The book ended up 750 pages, and that's condensed. Just to compare to you the eschatological elements in Islam as I learned them versus the eschatological elements that I learned in the Bible as I was searching the Bible, it was shocking. No one was able to document all these things, so I took it upon myself to do the most researched, thorough study in history to document the parallels of Islamic eschatology versus biblical eschatology. We know very well from the book of Ezekiel that there will be a war coming from the area of land of Gog and Magog. Now the scholars differ. Some scholars say that's Russia. I don't agree with that. Because if you look at all the Bible maps, they all clearly tell us that the region of Gog and Magog, Beth to Garma, Gomer, and those regions are within the regions of Asia Minor. Russia had a split. 
the CIS nations, the Commonwealth of Independent States, were Muslim, split from Communist Russia, and have their own states, which comprises exactly what you see in the Bible maps when you look at the area of Magog, Beth Tugarma, Meshech, and all these things. In fact, take your favorite prophecy book and look at the evidences for Russia, because there's many prophecy scholars that says Magog is Russia. Take these books and look at the historians that they quote. Look at the quotes they provide you of the historians of these nations and, the, and these tribes. All the quotes of all the historians say that these people live in southern Russia, yet the authors expand it to Russia proper. I know Russia supplies these countries with weapons, but so does America supply weapons to Saudi Arabia. Supplying weapons does not entitle somebody to be the Antichrist. You know, both talking about the Burak, in fact, Muhammad talks about his ascension into heaven via this being called Al Burak, which looks like a bird or like an angel. He wants to ascend into heaven. In fact, the story of Al Isra wal Mi'raj. Look it up on the internet if you don't believe me. Isra and Mi'raj, like Mirage, the ascension and descension as the Prophet Muhammad supposedly ascended unto heaven. The Mahdi will be the recreation of Muhammad. He will have the spirit and the soul of Muhammad himself. In other words, the Prophet of Islam will come again. Well, who dwelt the Prophet of Islam? What entity dwelt the Prophet Muhammad? It was none other but Satan. Satan will dwell the body of the Mahdi as well. So if Muhammad ascended into heaven, who else in the Bible ascended into heaven? I will ascend unto heaven. I will be like the Most High. You know what I'm talking about from the book of Isaiah. In other words, he wants to parallel Christ as he ascended. Christ ascended unto heaven. He sat on the right hand side of the Father. In fact, Muhammad sits on the right, hand, right side of the Father, sorry, of Allah in Islam, try to copycat the uh, narratives of Jesus in this case. So he always wants to parallel what Christ did. If you look at the very elements in the book of Isaiah, it's so clear. In fact, even if I look at uh, Isaiah chapter 48, in Isaiah 48, there is an interesting description of the Trinity. Very few Christians focus on these verses. In 48, verse... Uh, 16 come near to me hear this I have not spoken in secret from the beginning God is making a declaration and a very important declaration about his nature every Christian should know this verse from the time that it was from the beginning of creation I was there the father was there the Messiah was there and now the Lord God, the Father, and His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, have sent me, the Son. The Trinity in one verse this is a spectacular verse. And in the Old Testament, describing Himself. But if you look at the context of this chapter of Isaiah, He is talking about and He is addressing this lady of kingdoms, this harlot of Babylon, if you will. He's addressing this religion that comes out of the desert in accordance to John when he said, he took me to the desert, there he showed me a prostitute riding on a beast. This prostitute riding on a beast definitely came from the deserts of Arabia. In fact, am I out of time? You guys came here? How much time do I have? Oh, good, cool. Uh, I, call, I call him Taliban. He's kind of the beard. <laughs> and every time I see him, I, I kind of stutter and I get scared a little bit. <laughs> Look what it says in verse 14. All you assemble yourselves and hear, who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. Whenever you read the word, his arm, God's arm, it's always the Messiah. 
It's in Isaiah 53, his arm. He will send his arm to fight Babylon. And he's telling them, look, I have not spoken in secret. It's already been declared from the beginning of time that I am a trinity. That I and the Father are one. And the Holy Spirit was the one who sent me and the Father sent me and we are all one. Why have you confused the world with your dogma? He's talking to Muslims. Americans like to isolate the verses by themselves. He's always been talking to Muslims in Ezekiel. Even in the judgment and the nations that he mentions, which he casts out, cast into the pit, he clearly declares them all in the Bible. He tells us who they are. And in chapter 28, he addresses this character that calls himself the Prince of Tyre or the Prince of Lebanon. Tyre is in Lebanon. In fact, in Joel chapter 3, it's very clear. For I have gathered all nations into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment there with them on the account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom the nations have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. There is a division of the land that Antichrist does. If you continue the verses of Joel 3, he's addressing Lebanon, Hezbollah, and he's addressing Philistia, Gaza, Hamas. He's saying, who are you to fight with me? Gaza, you know, and Hezbollah in Lebanon, basically, Lebanon, which is a Muslim country. I was just talking to Brother Joseph Farah outside in the green room. And he is from Lebanon. I said, Mr. Farah, I admire you. You're one of the few Arabs that I know that loves Israel. How is Lebanon these days? He says, Lebanon is basically almost been recaptured, taken by the Muslims. I said, Lebanon is going to turn a Muslim country. He said, yes, unfortunately, that is exactly what's happening. We began to dialogue. I said to him, it's a shame that America does not support its allies. Who are the allies of America? It is people like Joseph Farah, Christian Arabs in Lebanon. It is the Assyrian Christians in Iraq. It is the Coptic Egyptians in Egypt. It is Christians, the Armenian Christians, who nobody cares about. They are Christians of the East that die for the cause of Yahweh. That nothing is done about them by the Americans. Not an inch is done. Nothing, not a nickel is spent. We spend so much money in building nice, beautiful churches. Yet we don't look at these persecuted Christians, nations being annihilated. What about the Christian Cypriots, when the Turks annihilated so many Greeks, converted the churches into mosques, and I saw the martyrs that were beheaded in the name of Jesus. Who's beheading who? You can criticize the Catholic Church as the harlot of Babylon till you're blue at the face, you can criticize the EU as the beast till you're blue at the face. Nobody will touch you. But the moment you criticize Islam, look out. It is politically incorrect. It is very uncomfortable. In fact, if you want to identify Antichrist spirit, it is the very element that is, when you speak about it, it is not very comfortable. But God does not want us to be comfortable. As I said before, he said, I send you a sheep amongst wolves. And I always say it, and let me say it again. If you don't have wolves in your life, you're not sheep. I don't think I have to give this lecture at a church of Jack Hibbs. All these Jack Hibbites out here have a lot of wolves. And I guarantee you, because I hear the stories from him, I sit down with Babyface and he tells me all these phenomenal stories. And you better not tell him I said that. Both gods are a torch. The Satan God and Allah is described in the Quran as a lamp. In the Quran, the description of Allah is clear. The most important verse about Allah in the Quran, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. 
Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. The likeness of his light is as a lamp, as a torch. It's like a hallowed glass that is like a star, a glowing star. And I said it in the Arabic so you can get it translated yourself. Know that I'm telling the truth. And that is in Revelation, very clear, in chapter 8 and chapter 9. In Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9. What does it talk about? In chapter 8, verse 10. Then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven. Burning like a torch, like a lamp. That is the devil. The very descriptions of the devil in the Bible is the very descriptions of Allah in the Quran. The very descriptions of the Antichrist in the Bible are the very descriptions of the Mahdi in the Islam. And the very things that are happening around us that you see Iran talking about and the Muslim world talking about, they want to change their plowshares into swords. Let the weak say I am strong because these nations are very weak. They're not stronger than us, yet they want to declare war against us. Their war will be futile. It is not edifying for me to tell you that America is going to be Antichrist and you're going to have a bleep bleep number on your forehead and you're going to go to the supermarket bleeping your forehead on the thing. <laughs> but it's edifying to say that we will resist Antichrist because Micah 5 says very clearly that God will raise seven shepherds and eight principal men and they will decimate the land of the Assyrian, the land of Nimrod, the land of the Antichrist. Those leaders will destroy the Antichrist. Seven leaders, very rarely ever talked about. Because if you look at the concept of the ten horns, three are plucked. There remain seven. Seven versus seven. All the wars of the First World War and the Second World War, there'd be a repetition in the Third World War. There'd be an alliance of righteous nations versus an alliance of evil nations, just as we had them before. And then in chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9, then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven. Because in American thinking, the star is an asteroid. It hits the beaches, and everything's going to be flooded. I don't know where you get that interpretation from. Look what it says, and I challenge anybody to tell me what that means. Look what it says. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven. If this star is an asteroid, then tell me what that means. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. How is an asteroid a him? This is a living being. Why? Of course, even the image of the beast. The devil wants to set up images for himself. Even in the New Testament it says, Do not worship Artemis and her image that fell from heaven. The worship of Artemis was in Turkey. It wasn't an image of a statue of Artemis, but it was a black stone that had fallen from heaven in which people in Pergamos used to worship it in Ephesus. So the Bible was saying, don't do these things. So an image doesn't necessarily have to be a statue. In fact, 1.3 billion Muslims today bow towards an image, a black stone, a star, an asteroid that came from the skies in Mecca. They all bow down to it already. The Antichrist will set up such an image on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem because he wants to be worshipped in Jerusalem. Why? Most likely Mecca will be destroyed. Because Islamic eschatology says that the time when the judgment comes in the ends of times, Mecca will be destroyed. There will be no longer Mecca. All these holy places will be destroyed, burned. Well, where did Muhammad get these things from? And why, if Allah loved the Muslims so much, he will burn their holiest place forever on judgment day? How does that make any sense? Why does he want to go in Jerusalem? In fact, both rule the Temple Mount. The Antichrist will rule over the Temple Mount and today the Muslims rule over the Temple Mount. It's not the Catholics, it's not the EU, it is the Muslims who rule over the Temple Mount. 
In fact, Americans want to still discuss the idea of even giving the Wailing Wall and the platform of the Wailing Wall to the Muslims, doing negotiations with the devil, giving the holy places. And no one cares about these holy places. Joseph's tomb was burned, Rachel's tomb desecrated, and the place of Christ's birth desecrated by Muslims. In fact, I wrote an article I had hoped the Jerusalem Post will publish saying that Olmert was entertaining the idea of bringing back the exiled terrorist who desecrated the birthplace of Jesus Christ, defecated in it, urinated in it, and did burn, burn flames all inside of it, stole all the relics, all the beautiful objects of the crosses and the golden crosses from the monks and, and then buried bodies in there and all these things as the Israelis try to defend the Christian community to bring those terrorists to justice. They exiled these terrorists, and now they're entertaining of bringing these very terrorists back. And I began to ask, I said, why do these terrorists have a right to return to that land? And I have no right as a Christian to visit the place where Jesus was born, to visit the place where Jesus walked, to visit all these holy places, and I've repented from terrorism. Only repentant terrorists are asked to be imprisoned. That's what they do all the time. Go look at the media. Just Google my name. Enjoy the read. As soon as I go to university, they say, if Walid Shaibat confessed to his terrorist activity, he should be imprisoned. If he put a bomb in Israel, he should be imprisoned. Who's saying this? The Muslims. But when a terrorist puts a bomb who's a Muslim, not one will say he should be imprisoned. In other words, only repentant terrorists should be imprisoned while real terrorists are set free and brought back to that land. I'm telling you, they accuse us of living in a Lala land when in reality the whole world lives in Lala land. We're the normal ones and they're weird. How much time do I have? Well, what, you know, I never asked them what time I'm supposed to quiet. Somebody has to tell me when it's time up, come here and do this five minute thing. Whoever it is, so I apologize. The definition of Allah in the, in the Quran, He is Malik al Insi wal Jinn. He is the king of the multitudes and the demons. In fact, there's a whole chapter in the Quran that is called the chapter of the jinn. The jinn means the demons. He is the Lord of this world and the underworld in Islam. And the Bible clearly says who that is. Only by the Bible can I identify who the true God. Man can never find God on his own. Only if he seeks with all his heart, his soul and his might can he find. And that's what I did. An unworthy sinner, terrorist, still unworthy. I seek God and God showed me the truth. So I must go to the, to the rest of the world and declare it. We must become ambassadors for Christ. They both desire the destruction of Israel. Both Antichrist wants to destroy Israel and the Muslim world is bent on the destruction of Israel. They don't want me to say that to you. As soon as I say it, oh, he is criticizing Islam. How dare he criticize Islam? Well, everyone criticizes Christianity. Just go to any bookstore and look at the shelf. Richard Dawkins criticized Christianity. Christopher Hitchens write, God is not great. Dare he write, Allah is not great? No. They will never do such a thing, but I will do it because Allah is not great. Yeah. They both enjoy the desecration of bodies. In fact, if you look at the New Testament clearly, it says regarding the two witnesses, their bodies will be desecrated in the streets of old Jerusalem. Look. What the Palestinians do when they desecrate bodies. 
If I went back home in five minutes, my body would be desecrated the same way. It will lay in the street for days. And that's exactly what will happen to the two witnesses. Who enjoys desecrating bodies? Who enjoys hanging bodies upside down in the middle of Bethlehem Square where Jesus was born for the whole people to see? Exactly. Satan does it and it happens to the two witnesses. Islam seems to fit. In fact, the Messiah himself fights Muslims. In every single part of the Bible in which Christ fights, in Joel chapter 3, he fights Lebanon and Gaza. In Isaiah chapter 63, he fights Edom, Muslim country. He comes out with his garment sprinkled with blood. In Isaiah chapter 10, verse 34, Lebanon shall fall by the mighty one. The Lebanon that converts to Islam will be destroyed by the Messiah himself. Isaiah 19. Who is he coming in the clouds? He comes in the clouds. Behold, he comes in the clouds. Coming to fight Egypt, a Muslim country. I am not talking about destruction of Muslim countries before the Antichrist is ushered. Because in Western th thinking, the destruction of Islam comes before the ushering of the Antichrist who comes from Europe. If that is true, why in every verse Christ is on earth fighting? He is fighting a Muslim nation. I can go on and on and on with tons of verses. Then those Muslim nations are gathered. Then they are thrown into the pit one after the other. From the prince of Tyre who declares I am a god, he said, I sit in the seat of gods, yet you are a man and not a god. That's Antichrist declaring himself to be God. Two minutes. And then he addresses, O Pharaoh king of Egypt, O great monster who lies in the midst of his rivers. Chapter 29, addressing Antichrist, calling him the Pharaoh of Egypt, a Muslim country. Prince of Tyre, Lebanon, Muslim country. Calls him also king of Babylon, Muslim country, Iraq and Arabia. Then in chapter 30, Woe to the day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord. And then he talks in verse 5, Kush, Sudan and Somaliland, translated Ethiopia, Libya, North Africa, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania, all Muslim. Lydia, Turkey, all Muslim. All of them cast into the pit. You can go on chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter of nothing but Muslim countries by God himself in judgment of Joel 3 when Christ judges these nations he will cast these Muslim countries into the pit one after the other and he even names them one by one. We must wake up Americans. We must thump our noses and become bigots. We must take that title with pride and not be ashamed to be called American, Christian, bigoted, xenophobic, whatever you want to call me. I stand with Christ. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is he your favorite terrorist? <laughs>